No, Your Honour. No, Your Honour. No? Uh, Your Honour, the only questions that I would have... I'm Mr Woods, sorry, I represent Mr Gleeson. Uh, the only questions I would have were to formally tender documents through Mr Gleeson. I've had an indication that I would be able to refer to those documents in any submissions that would be made without the formal tender. And I want to confirm that they're documents that are referred to in Mr Gleeson's witness statement and they're documents that have been provided to the Commission. So, with that in mind... Sorry, I missed that. They're documents? They're documents that Mr Gleeson has referred to in his witness statement. So they're documents that the Commission has in any event. Are they in evidence, though? No? Uh, well, I, as I understand it, they are because he's provided them. Um, if I need to formally no, tender them... No, they'll need to be tendered, so in some way we have a record of them. Your Honour, um, it's not the case that if they're just being produced to the Commission that they will be part of it. It's only if they are referred to in his uh, statement. Perhaps if my friend can identify which... Um, documents he's referring to by reference to paragraph? Uh, yes, uh, paragraph 87H. Now that's um, some submissions that Mr Gleeson referred to in his oral evidence from the contested hearing that he referred to. I'm happy to tender that document. Um, the following 87I is the uh, submissions in reply in that contested hearing. Mm, I tender that document. Well, should we bring all these in together and mark them together? Yes, I think so. Well, It'll be the second bundle, as it were, in respect of yeah. Mr Gleeson. So, H and I. Uh, now, I believe that's all, but I'll just check. The others might have been tended in the uh, earlier bundle this morning. And the correspondence with the police that was referred to by Mr Gleeson, some of that's gone in and there's just a couple of other um, items in the back and forth between Mr Gleeson and the police officer that are referred to in Mr Gleeson's statement. to in the sub-paragraph there, which are just quite short email correspondence. Um, I'm happy to give a list of each of those to Council Assisting. Uh, I'm going to do it now. Which sub-paragraph is 102? So, 102A. Yes. Um, 102B. Yes. 102D. Uh, 102E. And I think the last is 102F, and I think at least one of those is uh, in the tender bundle as well. Which one is 102F? Uh, well, both documents referred to there so far as they're not already tendered. Well, Your Honour, I tender as a bundle the documents referred to in paragraphs 87I, 87H. 102A, D, E, and F. That bundle will become Exhibit 16 15. Um, Mr. Gleeson, uh, earlier this morning, <coughs> we touched briefly on the fact that your <coughs> process. Um, has two outcomes, or potential outcomes. Yes. One is in relation to the entitlement of a victim to approach the, for want of a better term, the compensation panel. Yes. Um, and have the benefit of a finding in his or her favour in relation to the allegation they make. Yes. <coughs> the other is a consequence for the priest. Yes. Um, now, um, in the ordinary course, one wouldn't apply 
Brigginshaw to a decision as to whether or not someone was entitled to compensation for injury occasioned to them, whatever the <coughs> circumstance. You understand? Um, I, I think I understand what Your Honour is saying, yes. Um, I mean, it's a gross civil assault and damages for it won't require a Brigginshaw standard, but the balance of probabilities to be applied. Um, no, but if, if um, uh, there's a claim for compensation in respect of a rape, um, it would be my understanding that uh, before making a finding in that civil matter that there had been a rape, that Brigginshaw would be applied. Well, we'd, you may be right, but we'll be in complex territory when we start down that path. Um, do you explain to someone who comes to you and, and there is to be a contest that, in fact, the task that you're undertaking as the independent commissioner has these two functions? I think the answer to that is uh, almost invariably yes. Um, perhaps not in the sort of language that Your Honour and I have just been using, but um, I'm confident that during discussions with a complainant, um, uh, at some point or points, they would be told that um, uh, if, uh, as a result of making the complaint and the investigation, the complaint is upheld, then they'd be entitled to compensation and that uh, there would be consequences for the priest and that the independent commissioner makes a recommendation to the archdiocese. You see, um, if, if the priest is deceased, um, what's the level of satisfaction that you apply before making a recommendation that they can approach the compensation panel? The same standard, sir. And that hasn't been an impediment, to, as, as Your Honour knows, from the statistics in terms of complaints upheld. Um, the absence of the priest due to death hasn't inhibited the very common finding of a complaint being upheld to the requisite standard. You see, we've been told by a number of witnesses, including, as I recollected, Archbishop or Cardinal Pell, that one of the virtues of the Melbourne response was that the threshold um, that a complainant had to pass through was significantly lower than the civil threshold that would be applied in the ordinary courts to a common law claim. Now, that doesn't seem to fit with what you're telling us you're doing. I'm not sure in the context in which that, that had been said, but um, I, I agree with what you're saying, that um, uh, I, I um, require satisfaction to a standard of the balance of probabilities, mindful of the matters mentioned in Brigginshaw, and I, I do take the view that that's the case whether the offender is alive or dead. In the end, you're making a finding against a named person uh, that they've engaged in pedophilic activity, and I think it's important that you, you, you're satisfied that that's occurred. Well, are you familiar with the statements that are made, both in relation to, should, should I say, Melbourne response towards healing and almost every other um, redress arrangement that's been developed by individual bodies that, <coughs> um, although modest sums, if you like, are available, one of the virtues proclaimed is that the threshold is lower than if they went to court. I, I haven't heard it described in, in that sense. I've, I'm familiar with observations to the effect that it's, it's not a civil case in, in the sense of there being a um, uh, requirement of uh, proof of all aspects of loss and so forth. Um, but I must say I'm not familiar with the proposition that the um, standard of proof uh, before the independent commissioners is something less than the balance of probabilities. Uh, I suspect that what I have heard is about the process rather than the standard of proof. See, in an ordinary <coughs> civil case, um, given the lapse of time and the death of the alleged abuser, there would be all sorts of difficulties for a plaintiff, starting, of course, with the statute of limitation.
wouldn't there? Uh, yes. Well, certainly that doesn't apply in the independent commission. No, and um, the statute of limitation, of course, issue feeds or is fed by the fact that there's no one to respond because the alleged abuser may be dead. Yes. Um, and that, of course, has consequences in the civil process which don't exist in, as I understand, in your process. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, do you think it's appropriate um, going forward, if this was to remain, and you understand that we have to look at redress and civil liability? Yes. Do you think it's appropriate that the two functions um, should be kept together? That is, whether or not a person is entitled, if, if it remains a church responsibility, mm. to, to ask the church for redress, not civil damages, but just for redress and assistance, perhaps with counselling or whatever you put into a redress scheme, and require of that determination that it also be the foundation for, as you rightly point out, the very serious action which the church might take against a living abuser. Do you think they should really be kept together? My inclination is that they should, and um, uh, I touched earlier on the um, multifaceted motivation of most complainants in my experience, that is financial redress, um, and being believed and having the opportunity to put their allegations to the offender. Now, if the offender's dead, that last aspect doesn't apply, but um, being believed and naming the offender seems to me to be important to victims. And um, I can't readily conceive of a system that would um, split those two processes um, I think if there was a redress scheme that required a complainant to do no more than satisfy the entity that a, a, a priest unnamed had sexually abused them, um, that would be that would have its advantages in terms of a system just to obtain the redress. But I'm not sure that the complainants, that many complainants, would find it an attractive option. Um, occasionally, not very often at all, a complainant complains against a priest that they can't name. I've had one occasion that I can call to mind at the moment where they can't name the priest, and that throws up difficult issues in terms of being sufficiently satisfied, but not insurmountable issues. But if the, if the complainant can and does name the offender, um, it seems to me to be um, difficult to say to that complainant, don't worry about who the offender is. Um, this is all about getting you some compensation. Difficult from the complainant's point of view. Yes, the, the issue, I think, though, is some people, as I understand it, and I understand it from Mr O'Callaghan, uh, pass a sufficiently satisfied threshold or plausible threshold, whereas what you seem to be doing is saying <coughs> that you're, you've got to be set aside to the high level of the civil standard imposed by Brigginshaw. Yes, but um, uh, in circumstances where the offender's dead and, and, and can't and therefore does not deny it, and a person sits in front of me and tells their story in a way that it is um, compelling and palpably evident that they are reliving this memory of sexual abuse, uh, I'm readily satisfied that the abuse occurred to the Brigginshaw standard. The contested hearing process that you conduct, and I know you had limited experience with it, but it feels like a conventional civil court case, is that right? In, in many respects it does, yes. And I've said, um, I don't, don't want to be glib about this, but uh, it's the worst system for finding the facts in a denied complaint, apart from all the others. Sorry, you say it's the worst system? It's that saying about democracy. Democracy is the worst system, apart from all the others. A contested hearing is it's unattractive in many aspects because 
complainants are cross-examined. It's, it's got a degree of formality. They would be very nervous and apprehensive. Um, unfortunately, though, um, I don't think there's a better system and the positives outweigh the negatives. And uh, as I say in my statement, there is, in my experience, and I've done a number of contested hearings as council assisting, um, there's typically a, a positive sentiment expressed by the complainant at the end of it. It's harrowing for them, but quite a number have said to me the uh, validation that they uh, sense uh, at being tested on their evidence and being believed and being in the room as an adult with the abuser. Um, and typically there's not much communication between them, but there's uh, the complainants say that uh, to turn up as an adult empowered uh, is uh, important to them. So if we were to contemplate what the Catholic Bishops' Conference is suggesting and others, a national compensation, sorry, a national redress scheme, which could result in some money and other <coughs> response, it would be your <coughs> view that in relation to <coughs> any contest <coughs> of an allegation against a particular living priest or religious, that that scheme should provide a process akin to a civil trial to determine an entitlement to redress? Is that what you would be saying? Not akin in all respects to a civil trial, but, but there, there be a hearing to determine the facts. In the end, um, it seems to me that complainants want the facts determined. They want to be believed. And um, I very much doubt that complainants would get the benefit of belief if it was effectively an automatic process. Now, um, in your process, um, I appreciate your experience uh, as council assisting, and you're, you're paid for presumably by the church. Yes. Uh, is a complainant entitled to legal representation paid by the church? Yes. At a conventional commercial rate? Oh, I've not had occasion to um, get involved in, in, in uh, what rates might be charged, but um, I would expect that any reasonable rate would be met. And the role of council assisting in this process, is that akin to the role performed by council in the inquisitorial system? Um, I'm, I'm not sure which inquisitorial system Your Honour is referring to, but... Um, Let's just reduce it to lay terms so everyone understands. Mm. Is, is it accepted that it's council assisting's role to elicit and uh, the evidence of a complainant, uh, but also identify deficiencies in it? Yes, and that's a, a discussion that I uh, would always have with the complainant when I would endeavour to explain this strange role of counsel assisting. I'd say, look, I'm not your lawyer, but I will, in the case where the respondent is represented, uh, I will help you present your claim and your evidence, um, but you must understand that if you tell me something that's inconsistent with what you tell the independent commissioner, it's my duty to inform the independent commissioner of that. So never, never think I'm there to advise you on strategy or uh, I'm, I'm really just there to make sure all the relevant material gets before the independent commissioner. And what role do you take in relation to the evidence of the abuser if the abuser gives evidence? Um, if they're represented, uh, that evidence is led by their legal representative. Um, if not, and there's not been many cases where that's occurred, if not, then the evidence is led by council assisting. And what about any deficiencies or inconsistencies in the evidence? The same. And council assisting accepts the burden of challenging Absolutely. the abuser. Is that and, right? and I can think of occasions when, uh, during examination as council assisting, I would be uh, leading evidence from uh, either the complainant or respondent and say, well, um, I'm not sure that's consistent with uh, what you said earlier or something to that effect. It's, it's not a, a haranguing, but it's uh, I felt necessary to 
um, assist the independent commissioner by giving the witness the opportunity to explain apparent inconsistencies. So counsel assisting is neither a prosecutor nor a defender. Correct. But nevertheless accepts the role of challenging. Yes. Um, now if the accused, as is typically the case, is represented, the cross-examination of the accused uh, is much uh, more akin to a cross-examination that you would expect from counsel for the complainant. Now, of course, such a system, if it had a national framework, would be burdened by considerable cost. It, it would. Um, experience shows that uh, over 350 complaints have been made to the Melbourne response and there's been about 16 contested hearings. They're very much in the minority. Um, they're the hardest cases. They're very important cases and it's a cost that I think is justified. Um, it might be suggested that um, given the dual purpose that the cost might be justified more readily in the church's interest in terms of disciplining and dealing with aberrant priests and religious, but maybe it's not a cost you should impose upon a national redress scheme. Do you understand? I understand that argument, um, and I don't want to repeat myself, but I, I suspect that complainants um, would... The majority of complainants where the allegation is denied would think it was money well spent to allow them to... Um, have that process and be believed. Then logically you end up, if you separate them, with the church continuing, as it undoubtedly should, to conduct its own disciplinary processes, which of course would result in a finding on the having regard to the evidence yes. of a complainant, but separated from any redress issue. Yes, and I suppose there's a potential for inconsistent findings, which is another another issue. That may depend upon your thresholds. It may. Uh, and that's not an unusual uh, possibility in, in the law, given the way we approach criminal and civil matters. Yes. And also the way we approach now compensation matters in various places. Um, yes, uh, well, you understand the point. Yes. Um, and of course, we have to look at it across, not just in relation to the Catholic Church, but in relation to all institutions across the country, if there was to be a national scheme. It would remain the case, uh, I assume, Your Honour, that um, if in the redress component of, of this broader scheme um, there was to be a factual finding, it would be necessary for the fact finder to make a determination as to where the abuse occurred, when it occurred, and therefore who committed the abuse. Um, that sounds to me as though it would be a factual finding that a specific person has committed pedophilic activity, which raises the, the difficulty of doing so uh, to a lower standard than Brigginshaw. Well, it's being done now, of course, over and over again by different domestic bodies, particularly when the alleged abuser is dead. Now, I appreciate it doesn't quite have the same consequences, but it does to the relatives or others of that alleged abuser. It does. Um, it's a complex issue, ladies and gentlemen, but is there anyone who wants to ask Mr Gleeson any questions about those matters? No, thank you. No, Your Honour. No, Your Honour. No, Your Honour. No, 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 no. All right, Mr Gleeson, we'll... Thank you for your thoughts. Thanks, Your um, We have a journey to go in relation to the question of redress, but um, we will be issuing a paper for comment. Uh, I hope in January of next year we would welcome comments from yourself, Mr O'Callaghan, and anyone else who has a contribution to make in relation to these issues. Certainly. Thanks, Your Honour. Thank you. Otherwise, you're excused. Yes, Ms. Finnis. Uh, Your Honour, I call David Curtin.
good and you take an oath in the Bible? Or yes. Would you take the Bible in your hand, please? And repeat after me, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission. The evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. Yes, thank you. Take a seat, please. Thank you, Your Honour. Yes, Ms. Finney. Thank you, Your Honour. Uh, would you tell the Royal Commission your full name and occupation? David Edmund Curtin. I'm a barrister. So, Mr Curtin, you've provided a statement to the Royal Commission. I have. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? They uh, are. I tendered that statement. It will be Exhibit 16-16. Now, Mr Curtin, you've been Chair of the Compensation of the Melbourne Response since when? I believe 2004. Prior to 2004, were you involved in working in any respect for the Catholic Church? No. I had acted as an uh, independent commissioner for one inquiry, where I believe Mr O'Callaghan was conflicted or perceived himself to be conflicted. And I've probably done some personal injuries cases in which the Catholic Church was a defendant, uh, maybe a school or something like that. What was, uh, what's primarily the work you do at the bar? Uh, common law, with a particular emphasis in medical negligence. Okay. Now, understanding that it was 2004 that you began in this role, uh, nevertheless, I want to take you to some documents that predate your time as chair to, to understand what uh, principles or procedures uh, are adopted now and what considerations were given to various principles and procedures uh, earlier. So perhaps if we could have um, tab 16 on the screen. Now, this is a memorandum from uh, uh, Mr Chernoff, as he then was, in November 1996. Have you seen this before, Mr Curtin? Probably. And this is, as we say, very early days, thinking about how the compensation process might work. And if we can have page two on the screen. Uh, paragraph D. He states there that, the, his, in his view, the general approach uh, should be not one whereby it seeks to compensate the applicant for economic loss, pain and suffering, as may be done in workers' comp or personal injury. Rather, the tribunal may see its role as doing no more than deciding the appropriate amount that should be paid by way of ex gratia payment in recognition of the physical, mental and spiritual <coughs> sufferings experienced as a result of the relevant wrongful conduct. Now, that's survived, has it not? It has. And that is an explanation or a description as to how you conduct it? Yes. Uh, now, if we can go down to E, what's set out there is that the tribunal, obviously a precursor to the panel, uh, will be doing no more than making recommendations to the church. And that's something that you do? That's what we do. Um, I tell the victims sometimes that the amount that we recommend will be offered to them by the Archbishop. And I've never known the church or the Archbishop to demur from offering the amount recommended by the panel. So it's called a recommendation in order for you not to be making awards, as it were, but in effect you are making an award which is carried into effect by the Archdiocese. That's the effect of it. Just turning to subparagraph F, uh, it's there stated that uh, the tribunal will only assess the application once it's been established that the relevant wrongful act has been committed, and that's what you follow? Yes. You accept without question the finding of the independent commissioner? Yes. And we tell the victim that. We say that there's been a finding already that you're a victim, so there is no need to relive the events. Mm. And we want to put them at their ease about that. <coughs> I recognise that it's a, um, a painful path 
to go down. Um, and I want to do my best on behalf of the victim to minimise the pain. But it is the case, isn't it, that you wish to hear from them as to the impact of the abuse had and has on their life? Um, we wish to be informed about it. Mm -hmm. We do so usually by getting a psychological report or a psychiatric report. Mm -hmm. They're quite comprehensive and um, um, the people who provide them are people we're familiar with and they know what to, what to look for. Mm -hmm. And we tell the victim that we have read that report. I, I tell the victim of every document I've read in relation to his or her claim and make sure that they're aware that I have them and they've usually got them too. On a rare occasion, there might be a document that one of them hasn't seen and I then give them time to read that. And there's been an occasion where it's, a, say, a psychiatric report and I offer them an adjournment, if you like, so that they can consider it because I want them to know the basis of the way in which we're informed. Mm -hmm. So if it's the case that you, you don't require them to relive the abuse and that you can acquaint yourself as to impact through reports, what's the purpose of holding a hearing with them present? It's a respectful thing to them. Um, they are embarking on a process and they should be part of that process as much as they want to be. Uh, there's been an occasion where a victim doesn't want to come and we respect that too. But I have found that the victims, once they go into the process, want to see the end of it. Mm -hmm. And they often express at the end of it that it, is, it has been uh, helpful to them. Uh, also, I give them the opportunity to say anything more. I say to them, we've read all these reports. Uh, if they contain any areas of significance, please let me know. If it's just a date or something like that, you needn't worry about it but I want them to have the opportunity to add to or correct anything that's uh, said in the reports. Um, and sometimes they bring along a prepared uh, story. It might be a witness impact statement. It might be a statement that they prepared. And as I sit here, I can see in my mind's eye the difficulty some of them have doing it, but they say, I want to go through this. And they will also bring... Uh, often bring a support person, which my letter to them invites them to do. And sometimes they bring a lawyer, and the lawyers will do what lawyers do in these circumstances. Uh, now, just continuing on with this document, in paragraph G, there's reference to a confidentiality agreement, and we might come back to that topic because that's somewhat more sure. complex. In paragraph H, it was contemplated at at an early stage that um, there might be, and then rejected, cross-examination on such medical reports. Do you see that? Yes, there? I do. Now, that would only occur if indeed the offender was present in one form or another, wouldn't it? Well, I don't know. It's not been a part of the process <laughs> while I've been involved in it. There's never been any suggestion that the offender be present or there be any testing of the medical evidence? There is no testing of it. There is an evaluation of it by the members of the panel. Correct. And there's never been any suggestion that an offender attends. And can I say, because it's been sometimes said that lawyers for the church are there, they're never there either. No, well, there are four panel members, a victim, and anyone the victim chooses to bring, and no one else. I think that issue was sorted out at the very beginning. Thank you, Your I think you're on a means sorted out very early on in the life of the, of the Melbourne response. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, so it's coming down to I, <coughs> appropriate accommodation in the inner city rather than by way of office environment was suggested by Mr Chernoff. Uh, where are you located now? We hear it, uh, the compensation panel hearings in, I think it's Lansdowne Street, East Melbourne, but it's a terrace house occupied by Gearlink. Um, in my time, we've given thoughts to being, um, if I can use the terrible phrase, user-friendly to the victims. We want to be in an environment that's non-confronting. For a while, we were in um, offices in uh, the vicinity of the Archdiocese of Melbourne in the St. Patrick's uh, area, and 
Some victims felt very uncomfortable going back onto church territory. We then tried a motel in, um, I think, in Brunswick Street, Fitzroy, which was neutral ground, but it was unsatisfactory to have victims who would be waiting in a waiting room in a public premises. And the area that we've got now is not ideal, and I heard what Your Honour said about barristers chambers, not just to Mr Gleeson, but also, I think, to Mr O'Callaghan, Mr O'Callaghan. And, but if I could just describe this, it's a terraced house. There are two waiting rooms downstairs, so typically we will hear from three or four people. There's a woman who's experienced in this who will put somebody into one room. If someone else comes, somebody into another room so they don't see each other. And um, they will wait there, and, and, and it's quite comfortable. It's uh, more like a lounge room, but it's got a small table. They can sit there with a friend or a support person. I go down and introduce myself to them, uh, ask them if they're ready to come upstairs. They come upstairs with me, and upstairs is a if you can envisage the front room of a terraced house with a table. It's used as an office during the day. I, the first thing I do, apart from welcoming, welcoming them and introducing them to the other members of the panel, is to apologise for the, um, the nature of the premises, but I say we try to make it as informal as possible and non... If they, if they are, seem to be receptive of this, I effectively say non-confronting. And by the time we're five minutes into the conversation, I think they're pretty comfortable with it. Um, I heard what Jeff Gleeson said about barristers' chambers, and there's a bit of that in what we do too, trying to put them at their ease. Um, thank you. If we can now have tab 21. This was where the process had reached by February 1997. You've seen this document, Mr Curtin? Recently. Probably. <coughs> I haven't read all these documents recently, but the historical matters really um, haven't impacted upon what I do, and I'm happy to answer what questions I can about them, but you have to understand that this is all years before my time. No, I understand that. Um, now, turning to page two of this document... <coughs> Now, um, paragraph five says the panel would, will avoid formal hearings, but it may be appropriate for it to hold a meeting with the applicant. I take it from the evidence you've already given that in the vast majority of cases, the applicant does wish to attend and indeed does attend. I write to them once there's been a determination that they're a victim and I'm notified of that. I write to them and invite them to attend a hearing. Um, I think you've seen the letter that I write. It invites them to bring a support person, um, uh, and uh, it's not a requirement that they attend, but it's preferable that they do. Now, I think Ms Crennan, as she then was, was your predecessor? She was. And I think you've indicated in your statement that you followed the process as she generally she, followed? I had a conversation with her before I um, accepted the role, and certainly before I commenced my first hearing. and She was very helpful in telling me what she'd done, and I also had valuable input from all the other members of the panel who have been there longer than I have. Now, if we can have tab 33. Uh, this is the um, <coughs> brief that um, Ms Crennan, as she then was, received in August 2001. Now, if you just scroll down... There's reference there in the paragraph beginning, in addition, that the panel then schedules a time to meet with each victim for about 30 minutes? Yes. Is that what you follow? We do that. Now, that's not to say each one takes 30 minutes. Some may take an hour. There'd be very few that don't take pretty close to half an hour. Um, uh, but half an hour's a pretty good average. And, and we, we schedule them for half an hour, but if we go over time, uh, that's OK. And usually we explain that to the, to the victims as well. Now, just turning to that last paragraph on that page, <coughs> it's intended that insofar as possible the compensation panel operate independently of the Archbishop and Archdiocese. And that's what you were told as well when you yes. began. And then turning to the next page... 
And just to be clear, this is uh, you're being told this by cause uh, that cause provides administrative assistance, but doesn't involve uh, themselves in the detail of the case before the panel until the point is reached that, as chairperson, the panel advises of the panel's recommended figure. That's, that's your experience as well. That is. Now, just coming down to the uh, second page. There's reference here to, if we can keep scrolling down, uh, it may be that in the course of your contact with victims, you'll be asked questions about some of the legal issues arising from claims against the church. Now, were you provided with similar information when you became chair? I can't tell you that. Um, I've looked for the brief that I, I recall being uh, delivered, and I can't find it. But I don't recall any such issue being raised with me. In the course of acting as chair of the panel, have you had cause to uh, respond to complainants requests for information similar to that set out in this paragraph? <clears throat> I don't believe so. In so far as I can see that, I can only see the last line, Archbishops do not employ priests. So there may be more in the paragraph. Perhaps we could but... scroll so that we can see the, all of the dot points on the page. None of those matters have ever been raised with me by a victim. Now, if we can just turn to the next page. Did you receive information similar to this? That is that various plaintiffs have sought to bring legal proceedings, but none have proceeded to trial? I'm not aware of having that brought to my attention. Were you aware of that as a general proposition while you've been acting as chair? Um, can I answer it in another way? The, the victims that I've seen, I can't think of anyone who I thought was likely to have been able to bring a successful claim against the church. But I haven't discussed that with the victims themselves. Now, when you say they haven't been likely to be able to bring a successful claim, is that because of the structure of the church and identifying a proper defendant? Uh, there'd be no problem in identifying the proper, the, the proper defendant who'd be the perpetrator. If alive. Um, if alive or, or if at liberty or, and in funds. Mm. But um, there are, the other parts to it are, first of all, the, um, the nature of the church, such as that is. But secondly, the questions of establishing, if you like, a vicarious liability. Um, the cases, there, there are cases where there have been repeat offenders of victims who've come before us, but I can't recall a case where it's been suggested that someone in authority knew that those perpetrators were repeat offenders. <coughs> and by, by that I mean that it hasn't been an issue we've discussed with the victims. But we read carefully all of the information, including sometimes statements to police and victim impact statements. And whilst there were repeat offenders, as I say, I can't think of a, a, a case where that's been part of the material provided to us. So your evidence that you haven't had before you a complainant who you thought might take successful civil action is primarily based on that in each case there's not evident to you of prior knowledge by the Archdiocese in respect of the offender? Is that the that's, principal reason? That's part of it, yes. Is that the main reason? Well, the other part is the, the identifying a proper defendant. Yeah. And I don't have a dog in that fight, if you like, but that's my job is to award compensation to victims and to help them on the journey. Um, and so these matters are really peripheral but that's been my personal impression. Do you take it upon yourself as part of your job to consider whether they might have such a claim in order to tell them that? No. 
So you've never told a complainant one way or another what you think about their prospects civilly? No, and that's because I've never thought that anyone did have a claim. Mm. Um, if, if I thought that there was a claim there, it might be a different situation, and I'd, I'd consider that when it happened, but it's never occurred in the ten years I've been chair of the panel. But by that I mean I'm not, I'm not saying here I would dismiss that aspect of it. I see our role as to help the victims as much as we can. And so it's not part of my role to do that, but there may be something I'd do. So that if unusually, in your experience, a complainant <coughs> appeared before you and because of information you had about the offender and the knowledge of the church, if for some reason the offender was amenable to being sued and had assets, you, you'd tell the, the complainant? Um, I can't answer that question. It hasn't arisen. It's hypothetical. I'd like to digest it. But, but I, want to, I want to say this. My role is uh, helping them in the context of the compensation panel. And I would hate to give ill-informed advice that a, a victim who's gone down that path should consider suing when there were other factors that are, of which I wasn't aware that would mitigate against that and do more harm to the victim. The safer approach is really not to advise at all, isn't it? Yes. Can we turn to tab 16? Uh, this is uh, your document, uh, Mr Curtin. And you prepared this document for the purposes of assisting the Royal Commission to understand the processes you follow. I did. Now, just turning to the second page on Roman numeral three, uh, you say there advise the victim that such confidentiality doesn't apply to him or her, and above you refer there to uh, advising the victim that the hearing is confidential and anything said will be kept confidential by the panel, but that, that confidentiality doesn't apply to the complainant. That's right. Now, we'll come to this in more detail, but can I ask you whether, uh, as part of the material you receive, you receive a copy of the application for compensation form signed by the complainant? I do. And are you familiar with the terms of that document in relation to the confidentiality it imposes on the complainant? Um, I've had cause to look at it as a result of this Royal Commission. I, I am now you familiar might have with Mr. it. Curtin. Sorry? I assumed you might have looked yeah. at it, yes. Was it new to you when you looked at it for the purposes of giving evidence today? I don't think so. Well, we'll come back to that. Uh, now, down to Roman numeral seven. You refer there to an offer, and then if accepting the offer, uh, they'll be asked to sign a release, and then you refer to it as being modified slightly in the last few hearings, and that arises from Archbishop Hart indicating that there'll be a review process. That's right. And the purpose of that modification is to say the release <coughs> won't mean that they can't take advantage of whatever outcome there is of that review process. That's right. Uh, now, just turning to the next page, and Roman numeral 12. Can I just understand, if we, um, when you say you, you'll tell them they receive an offer, um, do they expect to hear anything from you during no. the course of the proceedings? I, no, Your Honour. I tell them that that offer will become, come from the Archbishop via the Church's solicitors. So in the proceedings before you, there's no debate about what might be a fair amount with the applicant? Um, that's not actually correct. There are times when a victim will say to me that anything less than the maximum will be grossly offensive, and I've had a victim say to me nothing less than $500,000 will be acceptable. And that was in the context of conversations we'd had preparatory to the hearing in which I'd made it very clear, both in writing and orally, that the maximum I could award was the statutory... Oh, sorry, the cap. 
Um, so so and, there is and, debate sometimes. Yes. I'm just trying to envisage what, what happens and what representations an, an applicant might to make to you. You tell them of the cap, but do they have any understanding of what will inform your decision either to go to the top or for a lesser sum? Not really, unless they ask. If they ask, I will tell them that we talk about it, and some of us may have different views, but we always reach agreement in the end. I used to tell victims that uh, the amount was not intended to be in any way full compensation, but a financial recognition of the harm that had been done. I found that victims sometimes then tended to focus on the money, and I don't criticise them for that. But can I say the majority of victims who come before our panel are not focused on the money? And indeed, it's surprising to me how few of them are. And most of them are having, as I said before, embarked upon this journey, are uh, uh, anxious to talk about the effect of the journey on them. Um, usually, it's about unburdening themselves of something that's been festering and afflicting them for maybe 30 years. It's impacted on the way they've raised their children and allowed their children to deal with other people. It's impacted upon their marriage and other things. So money is often very peripheral to it. And I took the view that going into details about money may only upset them about it because, and this has been the discussion of the Royal Commission, the cap is the cap and that's all we can award. And so uh, it's, it's not, there's not much point in me getting into a philosophy, philosophical debate with them about the cap. Now, you know that some people express dissatisfaction with the sum that they receive. Yes. Um, and sometimes that will be just because of the cap, I suppose, itself. Do you feel from time to time that the amount that you are confined to award uh, is not appropriate having regard to the suffering of the individual? Um, can I answer it this way? First of all, I don't believe it's appropriate for me to be expressing views about uh, the cap. I I've got people coming to see me in a few weeks' time and, um, and, and after that I'll have more people. I don't think it's productive in my role and helpful for me to express what are only private views about that. I readily agree that the cap does not reflect full compensation. But I want to say a couple of things about that. First of all, there are many victims who come before me who at common law would not be able to get any money. This, uh, there are state-imposed, government-imposed uh, um, hurdles for people to, to uh, overcome before they can receive compensation in circumstances where the government has no role. For example, um, someone trips over in a shopping centre. They have to show they've got a serious injury before they can get compensation. Um, so it's not just the government. It's circumstances where between corporate and individuals or between individuals, the government has put impediments in the way of people getting full compensation. Secondly, in common law, in Victoria at least, uh, there are caps imposed in, in damages that can be paid. And finally, um, as someone who's practised in that area for well over 30 years, I know that whatever people who are injured get is not enough. It's, it's pointless to offer a ventilated quadriplegic $10 million in damages. And um, I'm conscious of that. So I understand that what we're doing here is giving a financial recognition to a wrong that's been done. But beyond that, I don't think it's... I don't think it's appropriate for me, and I'd ask you, Your Honour, to excuse me in my present role from expressing any personal view about the efficacy of the cap with the church. I understand what you say about that, uh, although I notice in your statement, I think you say that 
at your urgings, the cap was increased. Mm. That's right. Back well, in 2008. Eight. Mm. I'm not taking full credit for that, but um, I, I became aware, or I was aware, that it was intended to uh, initially to mirror the upper limit of the victims of crime compensation, although it's slightly different because uh, there were, there's more compensation for pain and suffering, if you like, in the, in the church's scheme. And uh, I thought that the victims of crime compensation had moved upwards, and I, su I suggested to the church that they do that as well. Did but you... it, was, it was within that parameter, Your Honour, not as uh, a more genuine reflection of true pain and suffering, if I can put it that way. Did you hear Cardinal Pell's evidence last night? I did. About the relativities of $50,000 uh, today? Yes. Mm. Actually, I did, and it gave me cause to think about it. Yeah, well, everyone must, I think. Yes. Um, not only for your purposes, but you know that we've got the problem, we now got the problem ourselves. I, uh, I, don't fancy, I don't fancy having your job. No. Can I press you a little bit more? And uh, I understand what you say about your role, but um, uh, in your statement you talk about severity and effect severity of abuse and effect of abuse is the two global issues, I suppose, if that's right, that you're looking at. Um, without disclosing amounts, but do you as a panel, and you've been now doing it for 10 years, develop for yourselves some reference points with an endeavour to provide consistency? Yes, we do. We don't, they're not written down, uh, but we know each other pretty well, yeah. um, and um, we ventilate the issues in each victim, and respectfully of that victim, and um, we, I think I say in my statement, we each reach agreement, usually by different paths. I see myself as having a role to remind the panel that if, a victor, if the abuse is a cause of the victim's condition, that's enough, because often victims have got a constellation of you end issues. Up, you end up with a complex history. Yes. Um, and um, I think I say in my statement, our default position is that with penetrative sex, the upper limit is appropriate. There are variations to that, of course. And uh, what I found is very interesting about this is that with some people, gross abuse is well tolerated and mild abuse is not well tolerated. And can I tell you, I've acted for victims of sexual abuse as well, not, not against the Catholic Church, but in, in comparable circumstances where I know that what might seem to a layman to be not much uh, can have catastrophic effects for individuals. You may have heard me say the same thing in the course of the work of the Commission, but, and we understand that. Um, well then, if you do have a person who has um, what others might see as a low level of abuse, but catastrophic consequences, does that bring them to the top of the scale? It would. Yeah. It's the effect that on the victim that's really the most important, I think. And then, in, again, in your thinking, um, you know of the concept in your normal field of work of it being always possible to think of a worse case, um, which we lawyers tend to use in different contexts, including crime. But um, so we understand your thinking. Is, uh, do you approach it from the basis that only the worst case gets the maximum? No. Or no. do you see many cases that would rise above, if you're looking at a scale of it, um, uh, the maximum, which would be gradations of worst case, if you like? The latter. Yeah. Yes. Which really deals with what is in paragraph Roman numeral 12 yeah. in the document on the screen. <laughs> Yes. 
Uh, Your Honour, is that an appropriate time? We'll take lunch.